hosting this uh, webinar at the beginning of Open Education Week. Uh, my name is Tom Cochran and I'm speaking to you from Brisbane in Australia about the topic of building research profile on culture with open access. Uh, can I ask you uh, to check on audio setup through your audio setup wizard if you're having any trouble hearing me? And that's at the top of the audio and video window uh, on your screen. Also, if you have any questions on the way through, what I'm planning to do is to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes. There should be a few minutes at the end to respond to questions. As they occur to you, you're welcome to submit them through chat in the main room and then I will respond at the end uh, by audio. What I'm going to do today is to talk about what we did about open access to research at my institution which is the Queensland University of Technology, how we went about it, what we've noticed about its effect and some comments about the present debate about open access as we go into the future. So firstly a few things about QUT. We're one of the larger universities in Australia with um, it's actually about 45,000 students now, um, 7,000 or so international students from 100 countries and a growing number of higher degree by research students um, past 2000 and going up. We have six faculties, um, the QT Business School, Creative Industries and the others that you see on the screen and we have three research institutes that you can also see indicated there. We have above average uh, indicators of research growth at, at QUT. So our research income and our publications level, although the, um, the graph doesn't look spectacular, it's actually well above the, uh, the national average for um, these measures. How then did we come to start talking about open access and thinking about open access at QUT? Uh, an important thing here is definition because there's a lot of uncertainty about this. But the definition I'm using here and the one we started off with as our principle for policy is well captured by this quote from Zoe Corbin in the Times Higher Education Supplement three years ago. And that is that it's about the idea of free, immediate and permanent availability of um, research output. The reason that we started to think about it here was that uh, we were finding the costs of scholarly communication very high. We were finding, as did people everywhere, that the price increases year by year um, for the scientific literature, for other literature in journal subscriptions had no relation to any other indicator of inflation. In Australia we call that the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And we found that, um, particularly in, in the case of a smaller country, sourcing most of its scholarly literature from um, North, Northern Europe, North, North America, that it was further compounded by our problems with uh, our currency. The main drivers that allowed us to consider and develop and to um, push us on into developing an open access policy and practice were firstly the fact that we could before the age of the net. Um, it just wasn't conceivable to be able to put research output into the open. Um, secondly, the economic imperatives that I've just discussed. And thirdly, and perhaps more importantly as time has gone by, the realisation among a number of researchers that um, being in the open increases visibility and it therefore allows for the possibility of greater recognition greater reputation and greater impact. Uh, it's very important for me to stress here that a basic assumption at this university when we started to talk about open access to research was that we were talking about that um, proportion of scholarly output for which authors do not expect a personal return and referees who do the, um, the refereeing that is the quality certifying of the research output, similarly do this um, gratis, that is for no particular return. 
that's our definition. I will come back and say a bit more about um, books towards the end of this presentation, but it's important to understand that assumption. We engaged by monitoring the debates that were global going on on the net about this topic. We explored within the university the need to align our policy with researcher motivation and we watched the, the rise in um, policy, in mandates from both funders and institutions uh, in Australia and abroad. And this is how we engaged with the idea. We saw it develop increasing international momentum as well. Um, this uh, particular source called Raw Map, with which um, some people may be familiar, shows the rise um, from 2003 and 4 in three different places, in this case in the English speaking world, of the different kinds of policy mandates um, that have arisen since this time. So a bit about our journey. I want to talk here about the uh, university policy, about the development of our institutional repository, and then some of the evidence about outcomes and benefits that we've observed since then. So what exactly did the policy say when we enunciated it? Well, here it is on the screen. It was about the total publicly available research and scholarly output of the university going into an institutional repository and in that way becoming available worldwide. The framework that we developed mandated, that is, said we must do this with refereed research articles and conference papers. Um, it said that there's some other categories of output that were more optional. But it also made clear right from the beginning that there would be certain material which was exempt. And that is material which is to be commercialized or which contains confidential material that if we put into the open we would be breaching some legal undertaking. So we were clear about that from the beginning. Our preference in terms of any kind of delay in when material might be made available and visible is um, to do um, so at the time of publication. And we stipulate in the policy that requests for embargoes of greater than 12 months need to be referred to the Deputy Vice-Chancellor uh, responsible for the area. So uh, the QUT ePrints service was launched in 2003, taking material from 2004 onwards. And we found very rapidly that our scholars were um, given a, a choice between post-print and pre-print um, additions to the repository would, would choose the post-print. What's really important here is the way that the university's intellectual property policy, um, which I've highlighted down here, uh, complements the open access mandate that's come into, uh, into uh, being at QUT. Quite early on, um, the library, uh, which was the entity responsible for developing this service, um, started to provide immediate feedback to the users of the repository about the way their material was being downloaded. And over a period, these um, statistical pieces of information, these dashboards, have become uh, more informative. So we're able to provide usage statistics for each author, showing downloads uh, here on the, uh, the right-hand screen here, and also giving some interesting information about where the readership for a particular article might be around the world. We've also seen tools motivating researchers to do this improve. One of the things that researchers find very interesting is to be able to um, look at the way that their downloader statistics over here on the right might compare with their, um, the metrics of their citations from tools such as Scopus and Web of Science. And as you can imagine, researchers get very absorbed by the idea that they might have quite good citation metrics um, that are not matched by large download statistics or vice versa and other variations that you can imagine. 
one of the uh, very gratifying things that can happen with some pieces of research is that they, um, they score a, a first page result in a large search engine uh, query from uh, tools such as Google. Here's an example. There's 1.8 million hits in response to a search on financing creative industries and a QUT research item turns up on page one. Now, that doesn't always happen. Uh, in fact, far from it, but when it does, it's, uh, it's a very edifying for that researcher. The dashboards that are made available are also able to be provided to research centres. So in this case, talking about the Centre for uh, Accident Research, uh, where the centre itself is able to monitor the, um, the number of downloads, how the researchers are depositing, the most popular authors and works, and so on. And it's important to understand that some of our academic uh, organisational units provide um, rewards and incentives for depositing. So how is it looking after 10 years, bearing in mind that we started to accept deposits uh, at the beginning of 2004? We've, we've seen a, a, a lift. We've got the, the number of records that you see on screen here. And interestingly, um, the proportion of records with the full text attached, which of course is the desirable state, is higher for recently published works. In 2012 it reached 89%. And if you're familiar with statistics about um, uh, the full text proportion uh, population of these institutional repositories, you'll know that that's relatively speaking, a very high figure. Now I want to turn to some of the um, impacts of this on our researchers themselves and what we seem to be um, getting by way of um, evidence about the greater visibility of research. So here is one of our researchers whose area is air quality. Uh, she began uploading full text copies uh, in 2005 with that red arrow. Uh, indicates here. And after that time, we see a very sharp increase in her citation rates. And you can see for the same period the download um, uh, activity for her work. Here is another case involving a mid career researcher, in this case, a psychologist. And you see very much the same kind of pattern greatly increased citation rates seem to be associated with being more visible in the open. And here is a mature researcher in construction management where we've got a, a similar climb in the citation rate. So while we don't argue cause, there is very clear correlation uh, in this case. And in contrast, we have here a, a researcher in another field who has been um, less comprehensive in depositing full text, uh, but um, and, and, and has nevertheless a growing citation rate, but you don't see that same sharp, steep climb as with the previous examples. So what we're seeing for our researchers is a benefit of greater vis visibility. Um, we're seeing an impact on the metrics that matter to them in their research career and reputation. And we're definitely also getting evidence about new readerships that might not otherwise be attained by these researchers. Here uh, is an example or two examples of the, that greater reach being reported by faculty staff in different disciplines. And I'll leave you a moment to just uh, look at what they've written. So in both cases, reporting um, readers that they might not otherwise have, have expected, uh, Australian rural industry and uh, folk in other areas, government, private and not-for-profit organisations. The important point being that these people would not have had access to this um, through the subscription literature which they're not receiving. There's one faculty that's quite definite that it's getting new interest in research in the faculty by the visibility of its research in the repository. 
and therefore getting more HDR students, which to many universities in many countries is actually um, a source of income from government. So just taking a little while now to, to look ahead at where I think we're going with open access um, both here and, and more generally. And I want here to talk about um, the open access advantage, um, uh, the discussion that there is about ways of achieving it, and then say a little bit about um, books at the end. So I think that we see advantage um, in terms of what funders want to get for their for the money that they put into research. That's why we're seeing more and more uh, funders actually specify and prescribe that any work that they fund should find its way into the open. The Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom was about the first of these quite some years ago. In Australia we see it with the most recent announcement only a few months ago by our Australian Research Council. We've seen some very interesting policy developments in the United States as well. For institutions, there's the kind of advantage that I think um, at, at QUT our institution sees in having this greater visibility. For researchers, the effects can be rewarding as I think I've uh, argued. I think also communities uh, that feel as if they can be more connected with the scientific literature um, in this way of having it more broadly available. As a matter of government policy, that is what taxpayers' money should be spent on um, optimally. And I think within disciplines, there's also um, an advantage that, that can be argued. So from, all of the, from those six perspectives, there's a definitely advantage, which is why I think we see such um, a swing towards it globally. Now in that global swing, we see a debate between what are called green and gold approaches. And uh, just for clarity, um, an, an easy way to think about this is that uh, the green uh, road to open access is something that's instigated um, by the author or the author in their institution. And the gold is something that's instigated by the way a publisher places material into the open. At QUT, we have had support for both, um, but our main emphasis has been on our institutional repository, which is the Green Road. But it's an important distinction, and people often um, get rather hooked up on the debate about which way might be best. We think at QT that they've both got strengths and weaknesses. So in the case of the Green Road, um, we, we see that there are no additional um, fees or revenue required. Uh, it doesn't disturb, disturb the subscription model. In fact, it doesn't need to. <coughs> um, preferably, access is available at the time of publication. And if you're using an institutional or a discipline uh, repository, you get some very interesting possibilities of metrics about the way that research is being received as a result. Of course, it costs some money to set up. Um, the current discussion about embargoes on material in repositories that might be uh, sought by publishers of the subscription literature is an important constraint. And I think unless it is limited, um, is actually a, a, a very significant issue. And although there's no evidence that subscriptions get affected, nevertheless there's no doubt that some publishers have seen um, the Green Road as a, a long-term issue for them. In terms of the gold approach, it is a new business model for publishers. Um, it, it does allow uh, the aggregation of resource to do new metrics, so there's very interesting things that can come from the Public Library of Science and other well-known gold journals at present. And of course, from a publisher point of view, there's the possibility of adapting to this new business model. Uh, one of the weaknesses about gold is that there's a lot of confusion about how it's actually to be managed financially and subsidised. Um, people often confuse gold with um, the idea that all gold publishing is, involves article processing fees, that kind of input revenue. That isn't the only example of um, gold publishing. And of course we can see new price seeking behaviour as some publishers seek to both obtain 
revenue at the input stage while having their subscription um, income at the same time. And I think that's um, not got um, uh, much support from the market, and nor will it have. Um, I'd like to um, finish up by talking a little bit about the particular issue of books. Um, as we know, most books are published for a royalty of some kind. However, in the case of humanities and the social sciences in particular, there's a particular dilemma about the scholarly monograph, um, which is the traditional vehicle for expression of research in, in these disciplines, in, particularly in the humanities. And one of the things that needs to be recognised is that in this particular case, the publisher review role is, is uh, quite critical. So gold models for publishing scholarly monographs are likely to develop and increase. In fact, that's, that is exactly what is happening. And at QUT, we're very interested in and proud to be part of the initiative Knowledge Unlatched. But there are several other initiatives of that kind. And I think that as we've seen the growth of um, institutional repositories putting scientific research into the open um, based on um, the journal literature, so too we'll see an increasing availability of the equivalent of monographs in open access in, in the next few years. And we'll see that grow. So um, with that final comment on books, um, I uh, would like to conclude this uh, presentation. And thank you for listening. And I think there are a few minutes left if there are any questions that anyone has um, in the chat room. So I'll stay um, online for a few minutes uh, pending those questions. Thank you. Thank you for the question about the open access policy. Yes, I think our policy is available in our what we call our, our manual of policies and procedures. I think also if you check the library website, um, then uh, you'll be able to uh, to find it there. In the time available, I'll see if I can get a more um, specific reference to you. Thank you, Roger. My colleague at QUT has just put the, uh, the location in. Now, another question that's come up is um, the importance of the implementation strategy. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> it's one thing to have a mandate or an overall recognition and policy at the institution. It's another to implement it in a way that encourages the depositing behaviour. Um, People often talk about whether you can force people to do things at university. Of course, you can't. So I think what happened, which lifted our um, success rate to the current level of about 90% for full text, is the partnership between having the policy uh, framework together with a clever implementation in which the implementers at the university library were able to develop services that naturally attracted um, academic staff at all levels to the idea. I have to say one of the interesting things here is that we have new people joining the university as heads of school. When they become aware of the practice, the main question they have is why it's not more widespread. I personally think it will become so, but it's certainly true that in the first 10 years, we've been in a small minority in having this policy. Uh, 
Uh, the question about whether anyone objected to the policy when it was first implemented, no. Um, I did talk carefully with the, the Vice President for Research because that's a, usually a key, a key senior figure in our universities. Uh, it went through the University Research Committee and then it went through the main policy uh, governance body for all academic matters, the University Academic Board. There was no opposition, but there was a bit of um, informally expressed concern, including from one of our distinguished researchers. Um, within two years, however, I noticed that he was overjoyed to see one day that he had topped our list of downloads in one particular week uh, because the library did a very good job of keeping a record uh, and, and showing the record publicly of the top 50 papers in any week or the top 50 authors. And this particular professor topped the list one, one week and that was it. I think he's been an avid supporter ever since. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mina, I think it is good to have a renowned researcher on our side and I think we've got a few now. Um, but we, I think we also, it's uh, necessary for us to keep improving the service and enriching the data that researchers can get. And I think the area of improving metrics for research, alternative metrics to the ones that exist in the bibliometric tools is going to be a really important development in the next few years. Yes, I agree with the comment made about both um, top down and, and bottom up. Um, I think we've had both, we've seen both. Uh, but the previous comment about having a policy matched by a, a good implementation is the, the real recipe for success in this regard. Well, I think we're coming to the end of the 30-minute uh, the time for, for this contribution uh, to, to the week. So I, I believe it's uh, one of the first ones for Open Education Week and I hope it's been, uh, it's been interesting uh, for folk. And I, I'm, uh, I will sign off here. It's 5 in the afternoon in Australia and uh, wish you the best for the other activities during the week. Thank you for listening.